When I go out to different companies uh, talking about neurodiversity and its importance, I say to them, I am not suggesting that any of you perform a lick of charity. You're not creating jobs for these people as a favor to them. These people are providing you their exceptional services as a favor to you. They will revolutionize your workflow. They will help you develop faster, better, uh, performing and more easily designed products. They are capable of seeing changes that other people won't that would make things more efficient or more affordable. Um, they can see the simple solutions that once you point them out, everyone's like, oh, dang, why didn't I think of that two years ago? Because you weren't autistic, that's why. That's Alexandra Helens with a compelling argument on the revolutionary value of neurodiversity in the workplace. Alexandra is autistic, a member of Mensa, which is a society for the world's smartest 2% of people, and she champions the opportunities gained from weird and wonderful thinking. She leads the neurodiversity program for mining giant BHP and is chipping away at changing our culture to ensure we tap into the most brilliant minds to solve our most complex problems. I'm Sonia Nolan and I'm delighted you have joined us at my warm table today to hear Alexandra's journey from school dropout and Centrelink to Mensa and a most meaningful career. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining me around my warm table today. I'm so looking forward to hearing about your experiences and learning a lot about neurodiversity. Thank you so much, Sonia. Happy to be here. Oh, fantastic. Alexandra, let's start with that word. What does neurodiversity mean? Okay, well, uh, neurodiversity is the concept that there are many different types of brains and types of brain function, and all of them are valid. Um, none of them are inferior or um, derivations of one true type of brain. Uh, they're all different parts of the human experience and should be treated thus. So we all think things differently, we all yeah. process things differently, is Absolutely. that what that means? Absolutely. Historically, we've acted as if um, neurotypicals, that's the most common type of brain function. I like to say it's like straight but for your brain. <laughs> straight for your brain. <laughs> um, I like that. Neuro we've treated neurotypicals like that's the correct way to be a human being and uh, anyone who has a brain different than from that needs fixing or they need managing. And um, we've done that with a lot of things. We've treated male like it's the correct gender. Uh, we've treated white like it's the correct race. And um, many other things besides. And, you know, in this new age, we're finding out that that's just not so. That's a really good way to actually position all of this, Alexandra, because that makes it so easy for us to understand that neurodiversity is something that we just haven't been open to really exploring and understanding or seeing or accepting. Yeah. And, um, you know, I remember what it was like when I was, even when I was a kid, uh, back in the 90s, it was a lot meaner, um, a lot meaner place for neurodivergent people. Oh, and I'll just clarify, um, I am not neurodiverse. I am actually neurodivergent. Ah, so it's explain not, that to yes, us. It's yes, a, it's a grammar thing. It's not really an offensiveness thing. Uh, if you mess it up, no one's going to, you know, get hurt or anything. It's They're just going to say, that's not the right grammar. Um, I am neurodivergent because I only have one brain. Uh -huh. um, yep, it's not possible for me to be neurodiverse. Um, me and my buddies together, we might be neurodiverse. Um, and neurodiversity is something that we espouse. But um, each of us is just neurodivergent or neurotypical. Um, that's sort of the general terminology. And then um, neurodivergent can mean um, I'm autistic, or it can mean ADD, ADHD, bipolar, dyslexia, Tourette's, or uh, other neurotypes besides. And it's possible to have more than one of those neurotypes. Um, I have a friend who's autistic and ADHD, and another friend who's autistic and bipolar, um, but I myself am uh, just autistic. Right. Okay. So they're all. I, I don't know. Is is it right to say they're all types of a spectrum? Um, the the spectrum terminology is mostly just used for autism because there's the classification used to be there was low functioning autism, high functioning autism, 
and then Asperger syndrome over the top. And people used it to rank people as, you know, better than other people. High functioning people were preferable to low functioning people. And that's just, it's gross and it's a crude system and it doesn't truly show our differences. There are some things at which I am very high functioning, um, you know, public speaking. I love, I love networking and meeting new people and doing stuff like this. But uh, when it comes to other things like keeping track of a day planner and stuff like that, I'm much lower functioning and I need a lot of help with that. So we don't use that anymore and we say autism spectrum to represent that much like a rainbow has a bunch of different colors, we all have different attributes and some of those are stronger than others in different people. Makes perfect sense. So neurodiversity is a term that I have heard a number of times now. And, mm. you know, look, there's in a lot of organisations, there's a huge diversity and inclusion push. The latest approach to diversity is this, this concept of neurodiversity. So why is it important to workplaces to embrace neurodiversity? There's a lot of different reasons that it's important. Um, first of all, it's just plain the right thing to do. You shouldn't be discriminating against people in the workplace. And it's important to promote neurodiversity because uh, it lets people bring their authentic selves to work, which is something that a lot of corporations want right now because employees that feel that they need to shut themselves off when they come to work are less happy, uh, less efficient, less productive, and less likely to stay at your company. One of the things that a lot of people don't know about neurodiversity and also about disability is both of those attributes are strongly correlated with high intelligence. So if your company is making it hard in any way for disabled or neurodivergent employees to join your company, you're as good as actively saying, we don't want smart employees here. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because that is exactly what they do want, is they want yeah. the smartest no, people to course. be working they on these They want the smartest issues. people in the room, but then they go and inadvertently make it very hard for those employees to join and very unpleasant for those employees to stay. And why is that? Is it because neurodivergent people maybe challenge them and ask the hard questions. Is that some feedback you've ever well, had, Alexandra? Yeah, I think there's there's a certain part of that. But also in our culture, we've stereotyped the disabled person as unable to take care of themselves or the neurodivergent person as they have additional problems, so they're a problem employee or a problem citizen. But while they have had those additional challenges, they've also had to overcome those challenges. So a disabled employee isn't a person with additional problems. They're a person with additional problem-solving skills. Oh, that's a really interesting approach, yes. Yeah. I work in the mining industry. They're constantly worried about safety, and sometimes I get people asking me, oh, if, if I hire disabled or neurodivergent employees, aren't they going to be less safe? I'm like, no, no employee is truly safe. You have to practice uh, risk avoidance every day, but a disabled or neurodivergent employee is more likely to know how to be safe. They know what their limitations are, they know their weaknesses, and they know how to work around them. Your normal, correct employees don't have that foreknowledge. Right. So tell me about your work, because you actually lead a neurodiversity program for one of the large yes. companies in WA. Yes, I work for BHP. Before I came to work for BHP, I was on Centrelink. And I had been on Centerlink for about 10 years at that point. Being autistic and job hunting means a lot of doors shut in your face mm -hmm. as soon as they hear. So your experience at Centerlink over 10 years was yes. a, a very difficult stage in yes. your life. It was difficult. And I, you know, I, I was a smart kid. I did really well in uh, primary school and then I did worse in secondary school and I ended up flunking out of year 11. I thought that that was it for me, that I was going to be on Centerlink for the rest of my life. I thought I would never have a job, much less a career. Then in a really funny series of coincidences, um, I ended up in an internship program and then eventually hired by BHP. That's a huge leap from, from yeah. being unemployed and miserable to actually having this career where you're actually now helping other neurodivergent people to have a fulfilling career and changing the culture of an organisation to understand how valuable they are in the workplace. Yeah, no, it was it was a ride, that's for sure. How 
did it feel those first few months or even going back to the first few weeks, Alexandra, if you can remember sort of you, you've gone from being 10 years on Centrelink, waiting months to actually have this role sort of materialise after having a few interviews and then you've got a job and you're walking into a workplace, which is a corporate workplace, which, you know, to be honest, um, is quite intimidating for everybody. Um, how did you how did you cope in those first few weeks? It was great. I had a really great experience. I was nervous at first and I was feeling like just an intern and like I was a charity case. But my team that I went into treated me like a, a full, real employee from day one. They would ask me my opinions on stuff and be genuinely interested in what they were. And I was able to give input on the projects that we were working on. And it was truly just like being another one of the one of the employees there. So you were able to contribute at a high level from day one. You yeah. felt you felt like this is actually, you know, I, I can add value here. This yes. is this is where I'm supposed to be. It took a while to, for me to build that confidence, but uh, the the team had confidence in me from day one. That's a big deal, isn't it? The, yeah, to have was, other people have that confidence. It was in great. You. Uh, you know, ten years of Centrelink, ten years of being told that I was too disabled or too autistic to work. Um, any number of places. The only job opportunities that were ever offered to me were stuff like stacking shelves at Woolies, which I couldn't do due to my disability. So, you know, 10 Can you years touch of that. on that a little bit? What is your disability? Sure. Um, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, E-H-L-E-R-S space D-A-N-L-O-S. And if you can't spell syndrome, I can't help you. <laughs> I think we're all good with that one. Yes. So and what does that mean for you? It's a connective tissue disorder. It's to do with the recipe that my body has for collagen mm. um, in, in my DNA. And so the collagen that my body produces is not up to snuff. Mm. It's um, very fragile and it gets injured easily. So what that means for me is my skin is delicate. It's easier for me to tear it and it takes me longer to heal cuts and thing, bruises like that. I'll, I'll bruise very easily. You don't have to hit me very hard and um, all my blood vessels under my skin will burst. And also I'm hyper flexible, which is fun in some ways, but it also means I injure my joints a lot more. I, I had those problems and when I came to work at BHP, I, I said, hey, there's some stuff I can't do. And that was all accommodated immediately. No questions asked. So it sounds um, like you you actually had a fairly res well, very yeah, respectful no, workplace from nice, the minute you walked in yeah, at BHP. Even though I was just an intern, they got me a nice chair and um, you know, a special keyboard and special mouse to accommodate me working there. And now, some years on, your role is to actually be that welcoming yes. person at BHP for yes. other neurodivergent people that they're hiring to actually fulfill all of those smart, complex roles that they need at the workplace. Yes, I love doing it. Um, you know, from when I was hired, uh, I immediately started supporting the program that brought me aboard. Cause so it's that a, was in a, they had only just started the program? Oh, then? yes. I yeah. was actually one of the inaugural interns of that program. Yeah. Um, I was an intern that started in um, the first half of 2018. Uh, they hadn't had any interns before me and my cohort. The program is actually run by Curtin University, and it's a product of the Curtin Autism Research Group. CARG for short, which is an absolutely terrible acronym, and they really need to shoot their brain. They really people. do need to think about that one. <laughs> yes. Um, but there is another offshoot of, yes, um, of that. that is the ASQA program. Much better acronym. Yes. That's the Autism Academy for Software Quality Assurance, ASQA for short. That program is the program that gave me my internship. Um, they do a bunch of different stuff. They provide software testing education for high school and college age students, um, autistic students, because autistic people have a natural talent for software testing. M many of us, of course, we are not a monolith. There are some autists who are absolutely terrible at software testing. But we, we tend to be good at that sort of thing because we're very good at staying focused on one thing for a long period of time. We have a very high attention to detail and we're good at visualizing an entire system in our head, whether that's the system of a program or of um, a piece of machinery, something like that, a whole database. We can visualize that in our head a lot more easily than a neurotypical person. So this program is designed to create 
employment opportunities for autistic people because about one in three autistic people has a job. And that's any job at all that's even, you know, like one shift a week at McDonald's, enough to put some extra money in your pocket, but not enough to move out of the family home. Mm. So it's actually the employment statistics for autistic people are actually worse than even for disabled people. You know, the employment statistics for disabled people are pretty abysmal as well. Well, that's really interesting because, you know, the points that you're making here is that the qualities of uh, autistic people are so needed in the workplace. Yeah. And I'm just staggered that we wouldn't invest more in actually yep. getting those people into the workplace hey. to help solve those issues. I'm, I'm staggered too. When I go out to different companies uh, talking about neurodiversity and its importance, I say to them, I am not suggesting that any of you perform a lick of charity. Um, you're not creating jobs for these people as a favor to them. Uh, these people are providing you their exceptional services as a favor to you. They will revolutionize your workflow. They will help you develop faster, better uh, performing, and more easily designed products. They are capable of seeing changes that other people won't that would make things more efficient or more affordable. They can see the simple solutions that once you point them out, everyone's like, oh, dang, why didn't I think of that two years ago? Because you weren't autistic. That's why. Now, actually, this is something I want to ask you. And, and one of the things that you do say, Alexandra, is that ask me any question. We're not going to get offended. Please don't, you know, don't think that you can't ask these questions because you've, you've pretty much heard a lot of things in your, yeah. in your life no. and career. I've had a lot of people who have said all sorts of stuff to me because they were actively trying to be hurtful or offensive. Someone just asking me a question isn't going to throw me for a loop. No. So the question I want to ask is, do we say a person with autism or do we say an autistic person? Because that's something that just keeps getting debated in the literature. What is yeah. the most, what is the most Look, appropriate way yeah. to say that? Okay, the, the whole a person with autism thing comes from some older thinking in the disability rights community um, back in like the 70s or 80s. The thinking was uh, that at the time, disabled person was treated very pejoratively, like it was a way to insult someone. And they wanted to highlight that this person isn't just a disabled person, they're a person with a disability. It does not define them and it does not limit them or make them less than. So that's where that whole person first term terminology comes from. As disabled voices started to come forward and take over that community, as rightly we should, taking our place there, um, we said, no, disability doesn't make me less than. Um, I am disabled, and that doesn't dehumanize me. It's just a fact of who I am. You wouldn't say, um, this is Eileen, my co-worker with femaleness. <laughs> you wouldn't say, oh, this is, this is Gregory. Um, this is my, he's, he's a person with blackness, but don't worry, I don't think that detracts from his personhood. He's still a person to me. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm not a person with autism. I'm autistic. What are some of the other questions that you get asked a lot, by, especially by the executives that perhaps you're working with to help them understand neurodiversity and neurodivergent employees? What people mostly want to know is what they can do to be more neurofriendly. What do I need to do in order to enable autistic people or neurodivergent people to work for me. Although I have a hard time getting people to believe it, it's mostly just about deciding that you want to do it and that you want to be understanding. We don't need something super expensive. We don't need some huge doohickey or some fancy program to enable us to work somewhere. It's mostly about making the commitment to set aside your biases and your preconceived notions of what a quote, good employee looks like. We're hiring people to be programmers or software testers, and we're judging them on their social skills. Um, can they hold a pleasant and entertaining conversation? Do they look us in the eye? Do you need eye contact to be a software tester, or do you just need to be able to make screen contact with the computer screen? Fine, if they're having a public-facing role, then test them on social skills. But if they're not going to use those to generate value for you anyway, why are you making them do that? 
Um, so we're sort of using some blanket business rules, if you yes, like. Yes, and it's just it, it doesn't have anything to do with productivity. It's so true. And, in fact, going back in history, you know, some of the greatest discoveries that have changed and shaped our world were no doubt from some from really, neurodivergent people. Yeah, from some really weird people. Some of our most amazing developments over history have come from some Deeply, deeply weird people. Well, Einstein, no doubt, was yeah. autistic. Look at that hair, for Pete's sake. <laughs> um, but, yeah. And, and, and most of the amazing scientists who've made these discoveries that, like I said, have shaped and changed our world would have had to have had some sort of neurodivergence yeah. in order to be so focused and so tenacious about yeah. the discoveries and, the, and that sort of field that they just were going to drill down and drill down and drill down until they got to the answers. Yeah. It's... The stuff that makes you kind of a pain in the butt that makes you interesting and that makes you valuable. I I grew up in a community of, you know, deeply weird people, and it was those same things that made them weird or perhaps off-putting to talk to that also made them absolutely fascinating and really knowledgeable and experts on some amazing subjects and made them worth talking to in the first place. If if you're trying to make yourself more normal. You're not making yourself more normal. You're just making yourself more boring. I want to explore a bit more about you as a child. And you'd mentioned to me earlier, Alexandra, that you grew up in in America, which is why we've got this wonderful accent and and some of your fabulous dang and lick and um I, I, don't, I don't think you've said howdy but you know you've <laughs> you've used howdy there we go and you've said howdy so you know we've we've got some great um, Americanisms coming through our podcast today <laughs> and you grew up with uh, your parents who were both members of Mensa so can you tell me a bit about that and tell me what Mensa is. Yeah, my, my mom and my dad originally met through Mensa. Um, it would have been California Mensa because that's where they both were at the time. I understand the reason it's called Mensa is because in a couple different languages, it means month and table and meeting. And Mensa originally started as a monthly meeting of people around a table to talk about stuff because, you know, they just wanted some uh, lively conversation. And it evolved from there. And now there's tables all over the globe. I'm loving that it's um it's about sitting around a table and having these robust conversations because of course it comes back to me and my warm table. So of course that's um that's fantastic because uh, you know I I've said it a hundred times already, but I really do believe that so many interesting conversations and ideas and solutions happen around a table. And Mensa is proof of that. I'm Absolutely. loving hearing that. You know, when you when you're willing to meet people and just sit down with them and get to know them, um, you just learn so much. Solutions can happen. Yes. And Mensa is, it was started in the United States, but it's an international organization and it's the high IQ society. And in order to join, your uh, IQ needs to be in the upper two percentile of the population. In the world. In the in the world, yes. Yeah. It's not judged by by state or by country. It's globally. And, and IQ even really isn't about smart and dumb. It's more about Voltage, honestly, is the best example I can come up with. Explain that to um, me. Yeah, it's different people need different amounts of information at a time to stay engaged. So uh, an average IQ person needs a certain amount, and that's a lower voltage. And then um, a higher IQ person needs more information and stimulation in order to stay engaged. And it means their brain moves a lot faster, which is really good But for some things. But it also means... Sometimes you're moving too fast to be able to do something well. Imagine if you were trying to draw a picture, but instead of being able to sit still, you had to constantly be walking around the table. So moving at a high speed isn't good for everything. Right. And, you know, that's all it is. And that's that's what leads to really smart kids in class goofing off and getting in constant trouble with the teacher. And I got that a lot at parent-teacher conferences. We can tell she's really smart. But, you know, she has terrible grades. And if she just applied herself a little more, no, I was bored out of my skull and I, I couldn't do it. It was, I wasn't getting enough input, enough voltage. 
One of the stories you told me when we first um, met and spoke, Alexandra, was that given that your parents were both members of Mensa, when you had questions as a child, if you, yeah. you know, and and all children are like, why does this happen and what is this? And, you know, every, yeah. every child has I, got questions. Every child had questions. I had weird questions. One of my favorite books in elementary school was um, Alice in Quantum Land, which is a... <laughs> Say that is, again, Alice in Quantum Land, not Wonderland, Quantum yes, Land. Yes, Quantum Land. It was a parody of Alice in Wonderland, but also an exploration of quantum physics. I love it. Um, that was one of my favorite books in elementary school. True story, real book. Google it. I'm not making it up. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know... I grew up in Mensa. My mom and my dad are both members, and I have always had mental issues because I was autistic. So um, as part of that, when you're a little kid, that includes an IQ test just to run through all the basics. So I've always known that I am Mensa qualified, and I actually joined Mensa officially a couple years ago. And, you know, growing up, all the events that my mom took me to, all the cookouts and, you know, all the parties were Mensa community events. So I grew up very much in that space. When I was a little kid and I had questions about astrophysics or something, your normal childhood astrophysics questions, yeah, as, you, as do. you do. As you do, yeah. And um, my mom said, that's a really good question. Um, I'll just go, I'll email that through to one of my buddies at NASA and I'll get you an answer. Or, you know, that's, that's what being in Mensa is like. There are a lot of people who are very successful because they have high IQs. But also in Mensa, there are a lot of people who are really unsuccessful, really unhappy and really struggling to live because they have high IQs. Um, and it's, I got to see that gamut from a young age. So I've never equated intelligence with worth or with their value or, you know, how successful they're going to be in life. Success is not really anything to do with smarts or intelligence. As we round off today, Alexandra, I've so enjoyed hearing and learning and challenged about the awareness that we need for the work that the productivity and the the insights that autistic people can bring into the workplace. You had a couple of things that you would want people to, to leave knowing and being more aware of. What do you think that they would be? First of all, just that disabled people and neurodivergent people aren't a burden. They aren't a net loss. They are a net gain. There's a lot of incorrect thinking around disability and neurodivergency that's led to where we are, where we have absolutely dismal employment statistics. But once you change your thinking and you accept, okay, um, I may be neurotypical, but that doesn't mean that I'm automatically right or that um, my preferences are automatically correct. Uh, how can I accommodate an autistic employee? What can I change to enable a disabled employee to work for me? And once you just make that simple change within yourself, you will open up your workplaces so much more and you will gain some intensely gifted, talented employees and loyal employees too, because most of us just want job stability. Overwhelmingly in the disabled and neurodivergent virgin community, um, they are more likely to stay with employer long-term because they just want one place where they can have a good community and a good setup, get comfy in their chair and just stay there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's all I want for our community, somewhere where we can stay. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you around my warm table, Alexandra, and uh, I really appreciate everything that you've helped me understand. And thank you. Thank you so much. Anytime. You've been listening to My Warm Table with Sonia Nolan. In Italian, a tavola calda is a warm and welcoming table where you can share big ideas, friendship, laughter and life. So much happens around the kitchen table and I wanted to amplify it here in this podcast. My aim is to feed your mind and soul through smart conversations with heart. No topic is off limits, but good table manners rule. I hope you'll join us each week as we set the table for my extraordinary guests who will let you feast on their deep knowledge, life experiences and wise insights. Let's keep the conversation flowing. Please subscribe to the My Warm Table podcast and share it with your friends and networks. Perhaps if they're new to podcasting, take a moment to show them how to download and subscribe so they don't miss an episode either. I'd also love you to join our community on Facebook. 
You'll find the group at My Warm Table Podcast. Your support is very much appreciated so that together we can eat, think and be merry.